Наша страна известна своими экспериментами с квартирами и с квартирным вопросом. Мы переживали разные стадии от... Okay. Today we are going to speak about the avant-garde housing from the new building to the Khrushchev time building. And now let's discuss the trends. What is happening here? Do we want to own houses or do we want to uh, uh, to live there together with somebody else? So today we'll have Mikhail Alexievsky, chief of the center, uh, anthropology Strelka, Marka Mihic. Yevtich representing the pig company, Peter Isaev, commercial director, Capital Group will be with us, Oki Hauser, creative director, BMW Many Loving, and Michel Rockhand, uh, he, uh, senior vice president of architecture, the We Company. So let us start uh, with Mikhail. I don't need uh, the clicker because I don't have slides with me. Can just speak. Well, it's my honor and privilege to start our conversation of today from the research point of view. The Center of uh, Urban Anthropology I represent uh, for many years has been involved in the issue of new housing and we've had a research project on how the housing is selected as part of a big project on standards for new housing for RF, so for pre-project surveys it was. So it happened uh, in six cities and towns, starting from big cities like Kaluga and up to the very small town, the Gistansky Agni. Uh, in all these cities and towns, we conducted a survey. We interviewed people who had just bought housing, what principles they were based on uh, choosing it, and what features of this housing uh, were of paramount importance for that. So we had several uh, investigations like this uh, on the Moscow market. Uh, well, it is a different market uh, comparing to that of the small town of uh, the lights of Dagestan, Dagestanski Agni, very small town it was. But all the investors uh, and uh, any buyer is an investor, wants to see something else. What do they choose, these people? Um, well, I'm quite skeptical to the definition of uh, millennials. I think it's just a fashionable feature. Some investigators, you know, they uh, try to find out what yogurts do millennial wants. So I think it's nothing, just the terms. So uh, millennials are different. Uh, and the difference are millennials from Moscow, from Washington, or from the small city of Taganrong. So, our survey reflects that there is one issue which really changes the attitude to housing. And this is more age and social status. And the major gap here is not generation, but uh, before having children after. After people uh, give birth to kids, then they need new, bigger housing of different terms. So this is a crucial criteria. So the demand for housing uh, change as soon as uh, people get kids. Uh, Customers become more demanding, so uh, they no longer need, uh, need just uh, uh, square meters, meters or place, but uh, they need different quality. Young people here are the top users. They are in the avant-garde. So we have a new 
types of housing. Some people are really ready to share house of apartment with some other people. They can be their friends or not. Uh, they share the payment and they buy housing less. So today, if you have a house of your own, it means you are a success. Today, uh, home, a housing, apartments uh, is more important when you really have a family and kids. Uh, transport behavior also changes, and uh, that is uh, also reflected in the type of housing you buy. Accessibility of public transport is important for some customers. Not long ago, we had a focus group uh, and these were young employees. It turned out that uh, four of six of them uh, didn't have any car of their own, but they use car sharing. This is a change, but families still want to have cars of their own due to some other reasons. Clearly, when we assess some specific demands for apartments or housing, uh, then we could receive some inside information. So let me highlight one feature. And this is the changed attitude to the balcony. Since the times of Soviet Union, uh, balcony uh, is a certain advantage. Clearly, an apartment with a balcony is uh, better than without. So uh, mostly in those times, uh, people used balconies for some storage. Uh, well, something you don't uh, need, you can just uh, put in your balcony and keep there. Or you can go on the balcony and uh, smoke there. But this model changes, and we have started to need the balcony for some other issues. This changes the demand for the balcony and how it should be. By the way, this demand is different for different generation. Uh, young people prefer the, the so-called Hedonistic use where the balcony is the place you can relax and uh, not and not for storage of some things they don't need. Uh, young people prefer to have some chairs or armchairs, uh, have coffee there, smoke probably. Uh, everyone dreams about it, but. Uh, Practically no one does it because uh, the balconies we really have in our apartments, they are not so good for this kind of uh, using. Some people, well, have two balconies, so they can uh, use zoning. Representatives of uh, the previous uh, generations, uh, they have a different idea. They try to uh, make uh, one more room of a balcony. Some of them uh, make an office there. Others change their balcony into gyms. Uh, some other people just prefer uh, ma turning it into a silent place uh, well, where they can work. So the balcony is now something different. This also results in different uh, attitude to it, whether we need uh, no windows there, uh, panoramic windows or no windows. All this depends on the generations. Uh, some older generations prefer even the heating of the balcony. So this is uh, one example, but highly representative. So uh, planning new housing, we need to uh, look for the trends. 
So young people are going to the consumer's mind and to the consumer's market. And this is what we need to assess. Uh, but we investigate it, so we just like it. Thank you so much, Mikhail. Piotr will probably speak now how the capital group reacts this demand on balconies, not only for balconies. Let's start the slides, and the floor is yours, Peter. Thank you so much. It's difficult uh, to speak after Mikhail uh, because I think he said everything I wanted to share with you, but I'll try to highlight things, just not to repeat him. Uh, the most popular question on all the conferences, and not that only those of development. And the sounds as follows. How should we young with the young generation? And I have two polar answers for developers. Number one, nothing. Uh, just relax. Uh, if you want to sell something, you will not do it uh, anyway, because today sharing is uh, preferable is uh, preferable for many of them. So let's uh, uh, go back to history and see it is uh, not a new approach. Libraries, uh, kibbutz is a good example for that uh, from the history. So today we go online, offline. We have social sharing uh, when you can, uh, without any revenue, feel uh, you belong to a different class, topper than the, your uh, are really in. So, uh, top class or low class. Before that, financial component was top here. Today, the young people are different. They don't want too much consumption. They say uh, it is an environmental approach. The less I consume, uh, the less I uh, produce rubbish, and I live on the planet, and I need to take care of it. Number two, this is the young generation. They don't want to owe something. They go online and they owe the whole world. They can uh, change their jobs every month, every two months. Uh, they are crazy. They can go to some other part of the world uh, and change the job, change their life or study some different topic uh, and to get job there. Number two, kind of answers to the question, how should we deal with the young generations? And the second variant of my answer is, it doesn't matter. Any approach is okay, because they change as soon as they have children. Uh, ownership is still a stress for them. But when they have uh, babies, when they have uh, responsibility for somebody else, then they start owing something and buy something. So we developers cannot uh, force young people to get married, but uh, we need to take into consideration as, sh as soon as they get married, they will probably attach more importance to us, get back to us for, buy for buying something from us. So let me share with you the recipe of happiness uh, we've worked for them. So, first of all, when uh, the young generation starts to make uh, their choice, so first of all, they will go online. So, for every company, it's essential to have an image which would be uh, crystal clear. I'm not saying that you need to focus um, on young people. Um, because uh, at the moment, people which are the most active in the market are investors. And uh, we have the same people that will keep buying, and the younger generation is likely to keep uh, renting things. Uh, number two, real estate should be eternal for the buyer. It should be adaptive. If you buy a product, you realize that uh, maybe today you would like uh, to get um, 
a, a lot of friends uh, receive them in your apartment, but maybe tomorrow uh, you will start a family and you will prefer to spend uh, less time in a big company. Yeah, so it's not possible to uh, offer a, an apartment for 1,000 meters with just uh, one um, point of water supply just for a single bachelor. An apartment should be adaptive. And also, uh, the development cycle is quite long and fashion changes. Uh, if it's a dystopia to say that we can offer a product which will be in demand in five years' time. Of course, there are forecasted models based on uh, chemistry or mathematics, and but you always have uh, the probability of uh, like a random error, but the developer needs to make his own future. So if you would ask a buyer to predict what uh, uh, car model he will uh, have in 10 years' time, so in most cases, uh, uh, they will give the wrong answer because other people focus on that. And also in terms of Moscow real estate, yeah, you can give a 100% warranty that uh, real estate will uh, remain in price, especially in local currency, in rubles. The next question for mil millennials. Uh, when they buy anything, they think they own everything. So developers uh, try to develop a uh, smart house, but every uh, project developed should be part of the smart uh, house. It's not possible uh, to have a low margin and offer a smart city. But we can be in collaboration with transportation companies, with logistics companies, with IT institutes to offer a unique common uh, ecosystem. Uh, there are systems uh, which combine different uh, functions, which offer you spare time, and time is the most uh, valuable asset in our today's world. Do we have anyone in this room who learned to play the guitar back in the 90s? Yes, for me, it used to take me a huge amount of time. Yes, so I would uh, rewind a tape or on a a player, then I would throw it uh, at the wall, but now you will have just one app uh, which is available. Now uh, people will no longer queue for the bank to pay their bills because uh, they have mobile apps. And we are in active communications with uh, big data and other IT companies to create one single system. Uh, there is a lot of talk about innovation, but we still keep uh, and just boiling our kettles and or heating up like some pans. If we would remember the next uh, two slides. So our team uh, worked on them, but we have a designer called Dimon. So this is the way he calls himself. He's very creative. He's a millennial. And I was asking him what, uh, well, uh, you would not like uh, to buy real estate, so his uh, push um, advertising is uh, switched off. So the current generation sees uh, advertising as uh, something like this is a nice front wall of a house. So for this generation, uh, advertising will start uh, working when uh, these people will make their decisions, so they want to be involved. They want to look outside of the box, so they would like to use their own gadgets. They would like to go beyond the borders, what other consumers don't see in our augmented reality. So the three main ideas for developers uh, in order to offer a product which will be in demand for the younger generation. So it should be superior than offers uh, from 
competitors, so it should be internal in terms of adaptivity, and you, your view should be original. Thank you. Uh, Marco, we are uh, millennials and centennials, uh, and we have a lot of people like them in the room, like uh, Generation Z. Do you use anything from Smart House? Yes, I bought uh, Alexa, and I asked her to put the music, the music on in the morning. Yeah, we were all afraid of uh, of overhearing, uh, and now you bought it yourself. Uh, so, what Peak offers to people like us? Okay, so my story can be divided into two parts one about uh, the houses and another one for millennials so at our discussion we have uh, the type of people so i am a millennial myself i was born in 1990 so instead of guessing i can tell you what's uh, the encouraging factor however if you divide uh, people into marketing categories by age you uh, it would be funny. Everyone thinks uh, that uh, millennials need a special type of yogurt. Yes, otherwise Manhattan or every other city center which attracts millennials and other people would look like uh, you see on the page. People would abandon it and would look for anything. So this is a rare uh, Generation X uh, representative, but uh, millennials enjoy living in the city centers before they have kids. So uh, we can make the conclusion that millennials don't want anything new, uh, and we try to emphasize that we want uh, to do it. Uh, in a new alternative way. And I tried to formulate my statement. So what we want? I want to live uh, where I work. I would not like to live uh, two hours away from my work. So if I would get a job uh, at Skolkova, I would live there. If in uh, Chisti Ponds, then there. I would like to work where my industry uh, is represented by a flagship company. If it's in Moscow, then it's okay. But if such a company is in San Francisco, uh, then I would move there. I would also like to travel and change uh, my residence. I want to consume both uh, mass market and luxury, like uh, driving a Porsche car, but uh, going to a cheap supermarket. We want to live today, not tomorrow. And we want to be part of the society, not uh, just of our uh, family. Uh, we want to feel as we are a group of millennials. We want diversity and speed. T today we want something new, tomorrow we need something old. Uh, just like with music styles, it can be techno or hip hop. So for millennials, I want to achieve uh, what I want. Yes, it's even more exciting. For instance, a house with zero carbon footprint somewhere uh, in the desert, yes, and I would like to spend some days there, and I use Airbnb. But the other day I would prefer an, an apartment in a downtown with a designer uh, and a creative them, but then I would like to go mad and uh, want to live in Scarlet Tones, or I would try if uh, uh, sell by uh, Ginsburg architect. But I want to try everything in my life. This is the main driving force and the main change. So, and this is an indication that uh, we are okay with all offers in the market. We will never have time to try everything. But I would not uh, like to buy if I just want uh, uh, to try. Sometimes I want it long term. And sometimes I want it a long, short term. Sometimes I would prefer like uh, three days in an apartment in a foreign town, but sometimes uh, a year. I can live alone with my friends. Uh, we have like co-living 
as a topic which could be discussed. Actually, this is a very old formula, like uh, communal buildings were co-livings, but co-livings are an attempt to find a sustainable business model. Those who want what they want, they want uh, co-livings or uh, communes, and you need to find out how to sh sell it. And as for me, as an architect, as a designer, uh, there is a question of whether there is a difference in design of uh, shared or private. So with car sharing, we don't need uh, some special cars. We want them to be the same. And we are crazy about this uh, orange strip. Yes, we want the same things. We don't need to uh, reinvent the wheel for sharing. It should be like what we have today, or it should be better. And how uh, does it influence uh, architecture? Uh, it doesn't influence. So you can have an apartment in the very uh, center of Moscow with uh, a co-living. Or you can find a millionaire who likes living in the outskirts. So as architects, as construction people, as designers, we cannot think in the eternity. Yeah, we need to think about what should be uh, ready for adaptation, things uh, that uh, can change uh, immediately. Now, PIC and uh, millennials. So PIC is a Russian and uh, European construction company. So we have a big... Uh, influence on the market. So we are like uh, an elephant in a china shop. And people follow us even if they don't want it. And we are in construction business and this is a slow industry. A uh, normal project cycle is over three years. And in 2015, when Sergei Gordeev bought the company, a serious transformation was launched. And uh, we didn't ask anyone what people wanted at that point of time, what millennials who, uh, wanted to or other types of individuals. We are a big company, we have uh, IT people, we have uh, welding people, and we asked ourselves uh, what's the way we want it. And then we developed our peak standard, our requirements to residential buildings. So the process was launched uh, inside the company. So many ideas were contrary to the market. And people said uh, uh, many would buy an apartment when they are, when the building is not existing. When we built our first uh, buildings uh, at 2015, uh, so that they loved uh, the changes after they started to live there. We could understand uh, what uh, the consumer needs in three to four years' time. And today, many market leaders which are behind us, they try to copy what we offer. We are happy about that because uh, due to that, uh, the basic uh, environment and comfort standards, they change in Moscow and in Russia. Uh, four years ago at the forum, no one was discussing uh, how millennials will live and what the appropriate uh, residence uh, for millennials would be. And I think we managed to understand it. So we are available where you want to live. You can log on one website and find uh, a new apartment. So we have uh, hundreds of uh, apartment layout uh, options and we work on how we can uh, expand our portfolio. So this is what we offered uh, like one and a half years ago. But you see, so we have 154 two-bedroom uh, layout options. So we were the first people to break the trend and we started to offer furnished uh, uh, apartments. So, and uh, this year, 90% of our apartments uh, will be furnished. Uh, you can buy online. Very recently, 
we had uh, this, our first transactions, which was 100% online. And you will not have to spend time on the manager you are afraid of. And today you can also rent uh, apartments from us. A year ago, uh, we can also talk about sharing. Now you can uh, rent uh, your apartment and you can uh, monitor at what going on at uh, 3 a.m. That means that the map I showed you is broader. And we also can offer meals to you. So we have like a kitchen on your block service. So it's been actively deployed in Moscow. And uh, in, 50, in 25 years time, you can have uh, uh, re re ready uh, meal at home. So, peak group of companies is a big ecosystem, so we can cater for different types of needs. And I like uh, this phrase by Wayne Gretzky, the ice uh, hockey icon. So, you need to rush to the place where the puck will get, not where the puck is now. So we are trying to be ahead of the market all the time. And today we think about what people will need in two to three years time, not just millennials, because diversity is the key to success, diversity and also uh, comfort. Thank you, Marco. Our next question is about how we adapt to new economy and new realities of the world where we believe that young people have more opportunities but they have um, less finance so uh, there is a sense uh, that we we'll live that we became richer than previous generations but on the other hand if you would check the statistics so baby boomers in America had to work uh, 20 months to buy a new apartment. And now it's about uh, 15 years for an average person. So the next question and the next talk, yes, I would like to ask uh, Oke Hauser about how BMW Mini tries to address uh, that issue, that challenge where you have less resources, but uh, you have that uh, minimalistic demand where we want uh, uh, to leave less footprints. But on the other hand, we have less resources. What uh, would you offer uh, to customers in response? Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining the session. Um, yeah, a little bit of background um, of me. I'm an architect and I work at a car company and you might wonder how is that fitting together somehow. Um, I have to take you 60 years back in time. Mini was based on the idea how to shrink a very big car to the essentials while still get the most out of it. If you ever driven, driven a Mini, it's a fun experience. It was also um, yeah, an answer to the oil crisis and think about clever ways how to move inside of highly densified areas. So. The concept of mini and space is very, very much connected. And um, we started three and a half years ago to think about challenges that are actually the people are facing nowadays inside of cities. We know this. I didn't bring any dystopian pictures, but um, we know this. There's rising rents, like highly densified areas. We know that the future will be urban. Um, and I think it's a super interesting time, especially for architects, um, to think about new solutions, um, integrating a shared mindset. Whether it be millennials, I agree. I think it's not just a specific age group. I think there's a, a general change in the mindset nowadays in a lot of um, people's heads, um, targeted towards a more flexible life, um, targeted towards more um, a life that con that helps you also connect to people on a human scale, because I believe that's the reason why we move to cities, to be connected to people, um, not just digitally, but also in an analog way. Um, and I just, it's a very short um, presentation, um, just basically nailing down three principles that I think are highly relevant for the future. Um, so we've been working um, on big design events like Saloni Mobile, on Design Fest, to bring out installations and concepts to the public to um, start a discussion, basically, same as here today, um, under the, the name Big Life, Small Footprint. 
um, with the understanding that we believe that you can have a very small personal footprint while still getting more out of it. Um, so the three layers for me um, are basically the future is shared, adaptive, and connected. Um, and I quickly want to show you what we mean by that. Um, so we started um, three and a half years ago with our first installation where we designed a very small micro apartment. Um, it's a lonely mobile, roughly 18 square meters. And we thought about the element that really separates people from each other, which is obviously the wall. And the idea was that you can integrate all the functions you need for your daily life um, to share them with your neighbors by big shelves that can rotate to the outside. And of course, the more um, um, functions are shared with each other, like um, for example, one shares his kitchen while the other shares his uh, music system, the more life evolves between those, um, between those units. And we believe that um, you get more out of sharing, basically. You get more experience, you find new friends, and you create memories together. I think that's the, that's the main part we want to achieve with this. This is not meant to be a direct one-to-one -one solution in reality, but we wanted to um, communicate our thinking, what's, what's positive about sharing concept, and what really creates better human environments inside of cities. Um, we had this um, before, also, that the moment of privacy is re very relevant. I think that's something we always try to integrate with um, transformative architecture. You can also close down and to really enjoy also your privacy because, of course, both things are very relevant for, for each of us to have a moment of, of privacy and, again, um, being then connected to your neighbors. Um, so for architects, I think this potential that lies between and the blurring of private and public is super interesting. And that um, these are some impressions of the first installation we did. Um, that leads to the second layer, which is adaption. Like, how can we create a more flexible um, lifestyle, basically, with the help of architecture? And um, with our second installation in London, we placed three um, yeah, temporary extensions of your private apartment in unused public areas. Um, in London, if you want to live in the heart of London, you pay around 70% of your income to live in a very cramped condition. Um, and of course, we want to have a private dining experience with our friends and from time to time, but you can actually not really afford it in, in London. And you also don't need it all the time. You need it maybe once a month or just for Christmas. So we place three exemplary functions that we think are relevant for people that live in small um, homes. Um, it was a place to work. It was a place to uh, basically have dinner with your friends and it also a place to relax. And we place them like directly on the streets in unused urban plots to be shared by the public and be used by the public just for a couple of hours and then basically the next group um, uses the place. We also had a workspace that you can adapt with furniture inside because of course you can work in a Starbucks as an extension of your, of your private apartment but it's never really your space. It's always just a cafe or just a restaurant. Um, there was the relaxed space where you had your little moment of privacy and calmness inside of the city. Um, and as you can see, it's, it's all about um, thinking about new ways how to, how to use space inside of cities um, and how this space can be shared and provide really functions that people need inside of cities. So that um, leads to the third layer, which is connected. And I'm not talking about digital connectivity. I'm talking more about analog connectivity. Um, um, these are pictures from an ongoing series we call the Urban Cabins. It's uh, always the same unit. It's, it's about 18 square meters, integrating everything you need for your daily lives. But it's always very different. It, is connected via design to each location. So this was the first one you did in London. Um, it's also connecting you to the public. So there's always elements that can open up to really connect you to your urban surrounding because we believe we're talking about experiences. Um, we live in this kind of generic design world where a coffee shop around the world looks basically like in Brooklyn. <laughs> um, and I think it's very relevant that we find ways to articulate and to create a sense of space, of uh, place, to create a sense of home at the end. Um, so these are some examples of the, of the urban cabins here. As we did this was the second one in New York, um, always with the same footprint, but always with a different um, design background for each location, and always about this idea, how do you connect with architecture to public life? Um, of course, in a, in a more, let's like, say, um, metaphorical way. Um, but I think you need both elements um, if you come to a new place. You need to really feel which city you live in, even if it's just for a short time. This is the last cabin we did in Beijing for House Vision um, in last October. Um, and as you can see, different idea, but to always bring the outside in with the help of design to really connect it to your um, surroundings so you really um, create a sense of place um, wherever you are. Um, integrating a very flexible um, um, basic interior so you could push your bed outside, sleep under stars. There was the rotating table that you can really invite your friends or the public in to have dinner with you. Um, the whole walls were basically pegboards that you can 
um, rearrange um, really related to your needs. So we always think, of course, how can you create much out of the most out of a small space as well. Um, and for me, I think that's something um, really interesting as an architect um, to think about um, the layer or the aspect of time um, to overlay it with the aspect of space because I think that's something quite new. Um, and it's also a little bit different to what sharing meant in the past. And I mean, like, this is a perfect country, of course, to talk about sharing because there's a very rich history of shared housing concepts. But um, they always seem to be a bit either top down or a bit like, like a forced lifestyle, basically, that you had to fill in somehow. Um, and I think, of course, that's not matching what we want nowadays. You want flexibility. You want to be um, basically in charge of the functions that we use, of the spaces that we use, of the people that we meet. And I think digitalization and technology helps a lot to create, to really create that experience without a nightmare. That's why car sharing, all these services are really um, successful because it's just easy to use and without technology you would just not, and we would just not be able to, to have them um, as um, successful as they are at the moment. So as an architect, at the moment, this overlaying of space and time and to think about new concepts um, is, su is super interesting, I think. Um, so that's Big Life Small Footprint. I just want to give you a quick impression what we're also working on at the moment. So we're at the moment um, building three buildings, one in Shanghai. This is the project in Shanghai. We're renovating um, five buildings of an old paint factory to integrate the thoughts from the installations and the concepts in a permanent location. Um, we just had this also before. It's a hybrid f um, mix of functions. It's really urban. It's open area and connected to the streets and, uh, and the neighborhood especially. It integrates places to work, live and play. So. Um, I'm not a big fan of not leaving the house, but you don't need to if you don't want to because there's um, actually everything um, you need for your day life is integrated in there. Um, so there's a public um, lobby basically where we, we invite the city in to just join um, the conversation. And so it's, it's all about building open space to connect. Um, um, this is not a residential building. It's basically an urban building. And I think that's something that we are interested in, not to create exclusive clubs, um, but rather inclusive communities that are very well connected to the city and the neighborhood itself. Um, so some examples of the apartments we are, we are building at the moment, as you can see, some ideas from the installations, these rota rotating walls are integrated in the design. Um, and speaking about flexibility, I think this is just a little, um, just some options that you have. So you can, of course, you have your private smalls, like, quite small private space, but it's not about a small space, it's basically about endless space you can um, activate on top of that um, whenever you need it in a shared environment. Um, that's it from my side, I think, so that's um, what we're we working on at the moment. Thank you so much, dwelling on the issue of sectioning and how we can use resources uh, in a shared way. Let's discuss how we company started from co-working to co-living. How do you answer this challenge? What practices of co-working you use? And what novel ideas, decisions and approaches uh, you have? Michelle, the floor is yours. Uh, for the invitation, a uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, I have to confess, confess that I have never worked for anybody in my life, but I just joined WeWork uh, five months ago because I think it's a fascinating company that's, first of all, paying attention to society. No, it's not a company providing a solution and just going away to see another solution. Uh, we are a company uh, wanting to understand what is changing. No? One of the major things that hearing all, all of us talk here now, uh, rather than saying generation millennial or generation whatever, I think uh, it's a more conscious uh, generation or a generation that's more, there's a certain sense of awareness, an awareness that we don't want to waste food, we don't want to waste space, we don't want to waste time. Uh, some people see it as, oh, these millennials are desperate, they just want to do everything all the time. And, and I think we also need to learn of all these generations, no? And that's what uh, the WE company does, where we provide these spaces for society to thrive and understand how they're changing and how they're, they're communicating and, and, and activating. So, uh, again, I would say that one of the first things is awareness. The second that I would tell uh, all the developers that are here, anybody paying today for a market study, don't waste your money. There is no sense of wasting money on a market study today because we're way behind on society. 
If we pay companies to do a market study, we're paying for something that already happened and we're behind society in how societies are changing. We should spend that money in exploring possibilities and providing spaces to understand how society works today, how they work, how they live, how they interact, what they want to leave behind. And I think it's important to understand that platforms are much better. If we provide these platforms for, for, for them to come in and figure out if that flexible space worked for them or not, because it might work for a couple of months, years, and then we'll have to come up with another concept, no? So it's interesting, we're talking about a society where it's a well-off society economically, but if you go into favelas and other places of really, really low income, they share everything because they don't have an option. So we're trying to come up with these fancy names and solutions for, for a higher class society. I mean, we should see how we're actually relating and how this inequality will make a change. And, and I, when I was saying a, a, a generation of awareness, I think it's important that I st at least I see a lot of people wanting to give back. So uh, even typologically, there's a lot of people that want to, they, they would not want to buy, but they're willing to buy if they have the possibility that that becomes also a business and it gives something for the community. And what do I mean by that? These apartments that are lockout apartments, that you can have your apartment, but it has a room that's a lockout room that you can either rent for Airbnb or you can do whatever you want or it can become a, a small business that happens uh, to, to help the community or somebody around. Um, what is happening in, in, in WeWork it's called We Live, and We Live is the, 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 the residential part of, uh, of the company. And it's interesting, again, because there is, no, there is no solution that's a permanent solution. We're trying to figure out why do people share and how they share it. And when the company started growing, it came out of, 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 of renting desks and, of course, the office space that then we, we figured out how society was in, interacting and we noticed that they needed a different space. And then we also noticed that they needed a different place to educate their children. That's how We Grow was born as a school. So I think the important thing is that in a company like we, the We Company, it's not only about how we work or how we live or how we study or how we teach our children, it's about how society is changing. It really becomes something that, because we're a company that's paying attention and not only either rents a space and then just goes away or, or sells a space and doesn't give uh, much more attention to the person that was living inside the space, I think we're open to listen and we're learning from that. That's why I was saying market studies are outdated. Listening to people today in different methods of using uh, your companies as platforms becomes an idea because anybody here right now who would say, I have the perfect solution, I want to laugh at them in six months because that perfect solution will not probably work in six months, no? So everything is organic and we're obsessed as a community to say, we're going to control it. We're going to control the market. It, it either is shared or it's not shared. It's like. We have to be. We have to relax a little bit, and really uh, understand that that uh, all these changes and generations are only making us understand that we have to pay attention more and not repeat everything that we see. And not because a building sold very well for a developer in a certain part of a country, you have to repeat that. And then you get all these generic buildings that look exactly the same, and think that people or 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 families are a family of a man and a woman and two children. So it has like the three bedrooms for the ideal family. And, um, and I think it's, it's, to me, it's a great moment as architects because we're exploring and we don't have all the solutions, but we want to design and we want to understand how to provide, again, these platforms that have this, this flexibility. So it's not about somebody being successful and, and owning something. It's about, a, does it give back to communities? Are we giving back? Are we connecting or are we not connecting? So I think it doesn't matter the generation. We all f are looking for a sense of belonging. We are looking for, is what I'm doing meaningful in terms of how I live my life, not only my work, but also the way I live and the way I'm teaching my children. So again, I, I would just like to close saying that um, if we understand this as, a, as an awakening moment, because I think we, besides all the bad things that are happening, I think we are awakening to something. There's more concern, and I see it with my 14-year-old daughter, the questions she asks and everything. I, th I hope that we're the last generation that was a little bit eh, eh, bad, and that these generations, they don't need to think about it. They understand it much better than we do, because they really want to make stuff that, that really um, eh, makes it important. And that's why eh, a company like WeWork, eh, if you don't know the story, they, they come from a background where they said, we're tired of the generation I the iPad, the iWatch, the iPhone, 
we're, we're part of a we generation, that if we don't work together in common and we try to find solutions that will work for everybody, we're doing it wrong. So it's about collaboration, it's, it's we over me. No? So um, I would like to just close with that. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I would like to ask some questions and let us discuss what we've uh, said today. So this is a question for everyone. We've said a lot that we share a lot of things. What will we, you think we'll never share or what don't we want to share now as a market or as a society? So what will we never share or what don't we share now? Into the mic, please. Uh, could you please switch markers, microphone on? Oh, here we are. I have a theory that 100 or even 150 years ago, uh, That was okay uh, to buy something, to, to to sell something, to kill somebody. Uh, today, let us imagine somebody says, "I owe a person." People uh, think that this person is just uh, very bad. Now we owe things, and I think that uh, after a while. Uh, it will be indecent to say I owe something, some things, because land is something which belongs to everyone. Well, probably this is where we're going now. But uh, judging from our survey, people do not uh, want to share their washing machines and everything uh, which is connected to their own bodies. So uh, the common washing machine, the microbes, because we questioned a lot this issue of one shared washing machine on the ground floor, and people said, no, we'll not go with uh, our uh, things to the ground floor, and we don't know what other people uh, washed there before us, so this sharing does not uh, work uh, okay everywhere. Well, I uh, used to live for a long time in the United States of America, and I really like the idea of sharing a washing machine machines. In New York, they think that if you have a washing machine of your own at home, it means you are successful in life. When we have the same attitude to water in Russia, and it will be as expensive as there. Uh, people will stop being afraid of microbes, and everyone will go to the ground floor, floor for the shared washing machine. Anyone would like to add anything? To say that, yes, we're, we, we're afraid most of the time to share now because we think we have limited resources, and that's really something to think about. The moment we don't have enough resources, the moment we don't have enough water, we're going to share everything. And that's real. So it's very optimistic to say, oh, yes, I want this and I want this. I mean, we have to understand how the world is changing. And that's why I say that I hope that this is an era of consciousness and understanding that, that it's not that it's becoming fashionable to have a shared community, no? It's becoming a need. And that's very important to understand. Let me dwell on it. Russia and the Soviet Union has been famous for making experiment of everyone sharing everything. Well, in the 70 years of Soviet Union, some experiments were more, some other less successful. So we, the generation, uh, we uh, used to live in shared flats and apartments. Uh, what is the difference with what you are describing? Is it uh, because people sharing now for their goodwill and not because they are made to do it? Um, I have to make a confession. I never owned a washing machine in my life and I'm planning not to own one in the future um, because I think there's things you just don't need to have. 
I mean, we have way too much shit, basically. Like, everybody has way too much stuff. Like, that's, uh, that's sad, and I think I, I'm totally on, on Michael's side, and that, um, I mean, the way we are living is just not working. I mean, we have to change our behavior, and if somebody has a problem with some germs in a shared washing machine, um, then it's maybe a matter at the end how good the services of that washing machine. But it still makes more sense to share one washing machine or one car or one apartment or extensions of an apartment than to have 30 washing machines in one apartment building. And I lived six years in Switzerland, and I realized that it's, a, it's Switzerland's a very, very interesting place because it's super small, and everybody is, is basically somehow connected. Um, and in Switzerland, which is obviously one of the richest countries in the world, nobody has a washing machine. So it's not a matter of status <laughs> as, in, as in New York, it's just a matter of mindset. They just think it's useless. And I think it's, of course, there's cultural differences and, and all these things, but I really highly think that it, it depends what you mean by sharing, of course, because you, you don't really share it anonymous. It's not just, um, if you live in a house with like 15 people or something um, and they share a kitchen together, it's not, it's not, it's not um, they hopefully become your friends. They're not like, like foreign people anymore. And I think that's something where, where sharing really contributes towards building communities and not just from an economic or also ecological way of, um, it makes sense, but also to integrate you um, in, a, in a community. And I think nowadays, if you speak about isolation and all these topics in big cities, I mean, London um, basically announced a, a minister just for isolation um, because people are feel so isolated inside of cities, which is paradox because, I mean, um, you live together in a building, but you don't know your neighbor anymore. So for me personally, I think we should think sharing to the max, of course, without, um, and I think that's the big difference. It, in, in, in Russia, it used to be basically top down. I mean, it's not, you cannot create an ide ideology by just um, putting some, some thinking from the top to the bottom. The interesting thing, like speaking from a corporate perspective and from a brand perspective, like we and also BMW, of course, we, we need to provide business cases. And if people are not supporting the idea, that the business case is not definitely not working. And I think that's the right way to think about um, how to innovate. If you make people happy and you really feel a need of people, then you found the trigger. Of course, you need to um, push them a little bit out of your comfort zone, let's say, and, and innovate and think what's possible. But if they are not happy with it, then it just wouldn't work. And I think that's the complete opposite from, or maybe it's the same at the end of uh, what happened in Russia, like in the in the 20s, 30s, when all these um, shared concepts basically were basically pushed um, top down. Спасибо. Uh, thank you so much. If uh, anyone would like to add something, do it, please. I think Michelle is right. We are going to the epoch of uh, concern in Madman. There is a scene of the 60th century when uh, the character buys Cadillac car and they go picnicking. Uh, this is a very good family. They're all well-educated people. And I remember after the picnicking, they take the dishes, uh, put everything uh, into their car, but the rubbish is there and the dad <clears throat> throws, uh, well, a uh, spare beer bottle. Uh, that was an astonishing impression for me. But for our parents, that was when uh, these kind of experiments were started. That was a different time. I don't think uh, a, a movie character would ever do it today. So with time, we realized how much harm we do to nature. And we changed our minds. And kids are in front of us. Uh, they ask parents to sort uh, the rubbish. They uh, prohibit us to use plastic dishes. Thank you so much. Let me conclude. Today, we've discussed a lot that we need to share, to adapt to find the ways, but looking at what is happening now, what will happen in uh, 100 of years to live in two worlds simultaneously, but the most important change is we are become, becoming more conscious 
concerning housing, concerning places we live and work. Thank you so much for having joined us. And that is all, and the session is closed.